The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to worship at Eastminster Presbyterian Church in East Lansing. I'm Director of Christian Education, Neil Meyer. We are glad that you are worshiping with us today. On this day that by my count marks Sunday number 73 of this virtual worship season. And I want to say a special thank you to all members and friends of the congregation who made contributions to our virtual worship. I want to thank the church staff, especially Reverend Kristen Strobel and video producer Heather Meyer for their endless hours of video editing and producing and putting together the experience that we have all seen and worshiped with at home during this time. Thank you one and all. That being said, next Sunday, August 8th, is our scheduled return to the sanctuary for in-person worship at 10 a.m. next Sunday, August 8th, in the sanctuary at Eastminster. For those who aren't ready to return to in-person worship or those who will not be in town and still want to worship with us virtually, the service will continue to be live streamed on YouTube each week, starting next week, August 8th. So find us on YouTube at Eastminster Presbyterian Church, East Lansing, and join us for worship as we return to the sanctuary next Sunday. Also after worship next Sunday, we will have a special all ages event zooming through the church year. Community Life team has planned a wonderful gathering that will mark some of the celebrations we missed while we were apart. And so we will mark our return to in-person worship and our return to the church building next Sunday, worship at 10 and special event zooming through the church year, which will include lunch after worship next Sunday, August 8th. We hope you will join us. Today, we are once again glad to welcome back the Reverend Dr. Jeff O'Neill, who will be leading us in worship, in word and sacrament today. Please have your communion elements ready at home to participate in the sacrament at the appropriate time. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship God.
Let us pray. God, our refuge and strength, you are present with us in the journey of our lives. Assure us as we walk paths untrodden, as we live in an ever-changing and uncertain world, that you are sovereign and always present. In the midst of summer travels, the busyness of life picking up again, the wonders about what the future will hold, help us to pause once again and remember that you are faithful. Grant us calm and quiet, at least for this moment. We come before you, God, asking for forgiveness and healing. Forgive us for the ways we forget what you have done for us in the past, for allowing worry and fear to waste us away. Forgive us for looking out only for our own interest instead of our neighbor. We know that you are a good God who holds us in our anxiety and distress. You are the God of great and small, of birth and death, of past, present, and future, and you are the one who feeds us with healing and hope. Gather us in. Our gratitude and concern, our hopes and longings, as we worship you. Amen. Good morning, my friends. Listen now to the reading of God's word. As it is found first in the book of Psalms, number 88, selected verses 1 through 7 and 13 through 18, and then a reading from the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel according to Matthew. Listen for God's word to you. O Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave. 
like those whom you remember no more. For they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? Wretched and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am desperate. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. From all sides they close in on me. You have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor weep nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Could you show me two pieces of scripture whose respective moods are more diametrically opposed than those we just read. Psalm 88 is this manifesto of despair. Matthew 6, a testimony of cheerful confidence. Abandonment versus security. All is lost versus all is well. The two passages stare at each other across a stark spiritual divide. Well, maybe not entirely. After all, the writer of the psalm is still praying and thinking God is listening. He may be in a pit of misery, but he continues to insist that there is a God who is supposed to be caring about him, not bundling every conceivable misfortune together to dump on him. 
Now, most of the Psalms are just bursting at the seams with confidence in God's power, providence, and promise. But number 88 intrudes with a contrarian view that divine power carries limitations. Providence can cut toward joy as well as loss. And the fruits of God's eternal promises are not necessarily realized within the limits of a human lifetime. I have a file drawer crammed with bits of commentary that caught my attention at one time or another over the many years I've been collecting same. Riffling through that file recently, I came across this slant on life and experience. First, the bad news. Number one, life isn't fair. Number two, the question isn't why me, it's why not me. Number three, no matter how nice and charming and bright and lovable you are, not everyone you meet is going to approve of you or love you or even like you. Number four, from time to time it will rain on your parade. Number five, every now and then, no matter how careful you try to be, you are bound to do something unbelievably stupid. Next, the good news. Unless you're hanging around with some really mean people, no one but you will remember the dumb things you've done. Number two, you do not have to have an opinion on everything. Number three, virtually all of the bad stuff in life is survivable. A lot of it is even eventually useful. Number four, Although you're not nearly as wonderful as you hoped, you're not nearly as terrible as you feared. Number five, I've never met a grown up who, given the choice, would go back to being a kid. I like the list as far as it goes. It accepts life's pluses and minuses, and though it doesn't actually mention them by name, its themes are sin and grace. About missing the mark, but being loved anyway. Which reminds me of the recent flap among Roman Catholic bishops whether President Biden should be refused the privileges of mass and communion because of his stance on abortion rights. Several bishops maintained he's unworthy of the sacrament. Well, of course he's unworthy. Who isn't? Worthiness isn't the issue. If we have to earn our way into grace, well, then it's not really grace, is it? It becomes transaction, reward, a commodity to be purchased by someone's definition of right thinking and good behavior. In my experience, that sort of theology always produces good Christians in the worst sense of the word. Now, we'll be celebrating communion this morning as a community of the unworthy, or rather, a community made worthy to be at the table by the invitation of Jesus, the grace of God, the peace of the Holy Spirit. Number 88, our friend of the bitter psalm, really needs to perceive that he has that invitation. His spiritual, physical, and mental health is precarious. Death stalks him. God, he believes, has cast him off, thrown him away like a piece of human trash. Imprisoned in his bitterness, he suffers each miserable day in depraved isolation. 
Had we read the whole psalm this morning, we would have heard 88 repeat his complaint that his companions have all abandoned him. They are, as the psalm phrases it, in darkness. They've withdrawn from him, closeted themselves away. God, 88, is convinced, has imprisoned him in solitary confinement where no light shines and no grace is given. Now, in our better moments, few of us really believe God does these things to us. But when life is low, blaming is very tempting. When life and its hopeful structures have imploded, the last impulse of any of us is to be particularly sensible. It's probably no time to tell number 88 that much of what he is suffering needs to be chalked up to his own choices, his decisions, behaviors that have left him isolated and lost, or as the little list I cited a bit earlier, life isn't fair. We can chew on that ancient theological problem of how a good God could allow evil to exist, but chew as much as we want, we will still be hungry at the end. What we might instead chew upon is why we humans find it helpful to act cruelly toward one another, shutting one another out, practicing a hateful dismissiveness against those who disagree with us, don't look, act, or believe like us, who make different choices than us. As Jesus advises in Matthew, if we were to practice the righteousness of the kingdom of God, we know the blessing of a holy outlook upon life and its gifts and spend a lot less time in the dark. Our society seems to be splintering. The splinters created when history is broken up into kindling when political foundations are smashed, and when truth breaks up into tiny little packets of suspicion and fear. If we sense that we are in darkness, perhaps it is because we are dousing the lamps and pulling the shades and finding ourselves wondering why we have lost sight of one another. Will someone please turn on the lights? Re'ah is the ancient Hebrew word translated companion in the psalm. Close friend, lover, brother, associate, those would all be legitimate translations, but companion is the most apt English word for us because literally come, means with, and pan means bread, from the French. Companions are those that break bread together. Would 88 not begin to heal his bitter isolation if, we, if he could rejoin his companions in breaking bread together? His despair and our own is deepened by the experience of broken relationships, the, the withdrawal into sectarian cells, hiding out in our dark, dim prisons of thought. How deeply isolation and abandonment cut, and how long such wounds take to heal. Can we grope toward the light switch? Can we set up some tables where scorn is not the password to admittance? If we think our companions uh, as those who agree with us, who look and act like us, who hate what we hate and love what we love, then no, no light will illumine our plights. All of us, all of which brings us right back to that 
divisive issue of who is worthy to sit at the table and break the bread, who belongs and who doesn't. The Lord's Supper is not only a ritual of our faith, it is a marvelous metaphor of God's grace reaching out to all persons, those who love us and those who don't, those who politically agree with us and those who do not, those who look like us and those who do not. The host is the one responsible for the meal. The guests are responsible for showing up, not determining who's on the guest list. Were we and the world a perfect place, there would be no reason for God's grace to heal our fractures, mend our brokenness, and complete our incompleteness. Were we worthy, there would be no need for grace. Were we paragons of faithfulness, always living faithfully as citizens of the kingdom of God, Something new would be alive in our midst, foremost in our minds. The sacrament would be our fellowship with the Christ. And we would carry its blessings throughout our days into every endeavor, every encounter, into every thought. We cannot become whole by dint of our own efforts. We only become whole by the grace of God. We don't become a community by virtue of scorn. We do so only by responding to grace, by practicing love and hope, faith and purpose, patience and forbearance. Christ is the head of the table. He is the light of the world that pierces our darkness. Tables of grace must be set. Lights of hope must be lit. Repented lives must change. The bread of life must be broken. If not, darkness wins. My friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. It is written in scripture that people will come from north and south and east and west and sit at table in the kingdom. This is the Lord's table. He invites those who trust in him to feast with him, to sit at this table with him, along with the disciples who originally gathered round him some of whom would betray him or deny him. Others would sink into obscurity. Some would be faithful and spread the gospel. We are called to this table. Despite who we are, where we have been, what we hope for, although our hopes are created here at this table, for our hopes are to reflect all the values, hopes, dreams, and promises of the kingdom of God. When Christ was gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread, he broke it, giving thanks, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same fashion, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me.
As often as we drink of this cup and eat of this bread, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for all your mercies, the grace which surrounds us and upholds us, the community of which we are a part, the calling we have received from you so that our lives might have purpose and purposes that are good. Make us one with Christ. Make us one with one another that we may reflect your kingdom to the earth that we may be faithful disciples of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now continue your lives in the spirit of the living Christ, with whom we have shared the sacrament, with whom we share a human life, for whom we live, by whom we have promises of life in communion with one another and with our God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us this day and all our days to come. Go in peace.